can start from this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to the 40th seminar of SIGA. Uh, today, our seminar would uh, discuss Algeria, North Africa. We have discussed Algeria before, but this was before the recent legislative elections. Uh, our theme tonight is Algeria and the 2021 legislative elections. Was it towards a gradual democratic change or reproducing the old regime? As you know, there are different points of view on this. So what we'll try to do tonight is to explore these points of view and try to have a better understanding of Algeria, what happened inside, and also its impact on neighbors. You know, we'll try also to, uh, as much as possible to understand the different uh, uh, policies that take place today in North Africa, whether it's with respect to Morocco, Tunisia, as you know, what's happening there and its impact, as well as uh, Libya and, and generally speaking, North Africa. But of course, our concentration will be more domestically tonight and the impact of the legislative elections. I hope also to understand or to have a better understanding of the civil military relations if possible. This will be one of my questions. Uh, helping me tonight in moderating uh, this session is Jalal Khshayib. Jalal is a senior SIGA associate uh, uh, here at SIGA at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs. He, his specialty is geopolitics. He's also the editor in chief of a new coming publication that we'll have, which would be called Geopolitical Bridges. Uh, Jalal is originally from Algeria and he is a PhD candidate. He will introduce our three uh, uh, speakers and we have great panel tonight. I'm very proud to have uh, our uh, panelists tonight. Uh, uh, Dr. Idris Atiyah from the University of Algiers, uh, Dr. Tin Hinan El Qadi, who's an associate fellow uh, at Chatham House and Dr. Abdel Noor Toumi, who's also an expert at Orsam, which is the Middle East Studies Center in Ankara, Turkey. Jalal. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to our new program. And as Dr. Sami said, our new topic is Algeria. And today we're gonna discuss this topic and the, and the of political change since uh, the last Iraq uh, to, uh, 2019. And as you know, uh, the country witnessed a crucial turning point uh, in February 2019 when the Algerian people uh, with some, of course, political interaction inside the, the regime, the Algerian regime overthrew the, the Bouteflika regime. And the country witnessed like uh, a political vacuum uh, during uh, one year and with the huge protests and polarization, harsh uh, political debates among people and, and elites uh, about the appropriate political uh, process and tools to, to establish a new era and the new regime too. So uh, briefly in November, uh, 2019, Mr. Abdelmajid uh, Tabun became the new president of Algeria, uh, as you know, after the controversial elections, and he promised to initiate some deep uh, political changes in the regime and establish a new uh, era of democracy. And since then, Algeria witnessed some political uh, events, uh, uh, such as, uh, like you like you know, the new constitutions, referendum on new constitutions, a new government, also uh, finally legislative elections and the new other uh, government too. So in this webinar, uh, we try, we're gonna try to, to evaluate this political path and asking the main question of this panel, uh, so is the situation in Algeria heading toward such like a gradual democratic change or just we are now uh, against like uh, uh, reproducing the old regime. So in order to answer this question and discuss others, so I'm happy to, to have here in this discussion, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Idris Ataya, 
يو ار ويلكم دكتور ادريس اهلا وسهلا استاذ جلال شكرا لك على هذه الدعوه الكريمه وعلى هذه الفرصه الجميله التي جمعتني باساتذه وبزملاء افاضل من تركيا الشقيقه ثانك يو دكتور ادريس دكتور ادريس از بروفيسور اوف بوليتيكال ساينس اند انترناشونال ريليشنز ات الجيريس فري يونيفرسيتي ان الجيريا اند هي هولد بي اتش دي فروم ذا سيم يونيفرسيتي ان انترناشونال ريليشنز اند نما ان افريكان ستاديز اند انترناشونال ريليشن ات ذا سيم يونيفرسيتي اند هي از اولسو بين وركين از كونتراكتد بروفيسور at the Command and Staff School at the Algerian Ministry of National Defense. Also, he has been working as contracted professor at the Algerian uh, Military School of Information and Communication uh, since September 2020. And Dr. Atiyah has held several scientific and administrative uh, positions uh, since years in uh, Algiers University and Tibisa, also uh, Eastern of Algeria University. And besides his uh, huge experience, Dr. Atiyah has many academic publications, uh, three books, published books, and three other under publications, mashallah, in addition to thousands of studies and articles, press interviews. And his main research fields is security, strategic studies, as well as uh, the Arab and African, uh, African authors. And I'm happy to to uh, invite in this discussion, Dr. Uh, Tinhinan Al-Qadi. You are welcome, Dr. Tinhinan. Hi, thanks a lot for the invitation. Very happy to be with you all today. You are welcome. Dr. Tinhinan is a political economic researcher and associate fellow at Chatham House in UK. Uh, and she is a part of uh, Middle East and North Africa program at the same institutions uh, she goes is Bachelor in Politics from SOAS University of London. And also she is part of research team of LSE, the, the, the London School of Economics and investigating the political economy of data-driven innovations. And she works also with another pro projects at LSE, uh, uh, LCE, uh, focusing on North-South knowledge production and application implications for uh, the integration of development country, uh, countries in the global knowledge economy. And her research interests include innovation and the knowledge economy, information and communication technology and development, state business relations, frontier states and democratic issues, and as well as the chi uh, China and North African issues. Uh, and uh, she published a lot in different academic journals and, uh, and magazines. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to, to have Dr. Uh, Abdel Nortoumi. You are welcome, Dr. Abdel Nortoumi. Good evening and uh, good evening to my dear colleagues and the panelists. And uh, thank you very much for having us this evening and giving us this opportunity to speak about what's the latest or what's going on in Algeria. And thank you very much. You are welcome, Dr. Dr. Uh, Abdunur is a North African studies expert at Orsam, uh, Middle Eastern Studies Center based here in Turkey, in Ankara. And he got his MA in public law uh, from University of Toulouse uh, uh, in France and Diploma of Advanced Studies in Political Sciences. And he served as a lecturer in the Dep in Department of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at uh, Portland Community College. And he uh, also served as a France and Maghreb correspondent for the Arab Daily News in Chicago in Uni United States and research analyst and uh, coordinators uh, at the Center of Arab Studies and Development in Paris, in France, as well as humanitarian analysts at the Strategic and International Relations Institute, Institute uh, IRIS in Paris, in Paris, France. And Dr. Tomi also is an active author and he has uh, uh, different contribution articles uh, appear you know, on Orsam Daily Sabah newspaper and Sociology of Islam Journal and others. 
And recently, Dr. Tumi published a book on Algeria, uh, fortunately, so uh, uh, and entitled From Hope to Uncertainty, the Anatomy of Algerian Herak. And uh, I would like to benefit from uh, some fresh ideas in our discussions, inshallah. So uh, as Dr. Semi said, uh, each speaker now have like around 20 minutes uh, to ask the, to answer in our main uh, question, then we, we're gonna open the door for discussions and, uh, and the Q&A. And uh, please let me start with, uh, uh, with Dr. Atiyah. By the way, Dr. Atiyah's presentation will be in Arabic and our professor, Dr. Sami, uh, gonna give us some uh, translation of some general ideas. So, and I would like to start with you, Dr. Uh, Atiyah. Uh, so in general, I would like to ask, ask you if um, about your perspective uh, regarding uh, these two years of political path and progress in Algeria. So uh, since the collapse of Botflika regime, so how you can evaluate this path and uh, do you think Algeria really entered in a new era or what was called the new Algeria, Al Jazair Al Jadida? Okay, Shukran Jazeera, Ustad Khashib. In the case of the case, the case is very important for the country. And I thank you and thank all the members of the country who are with us and with us. هذا الموضوع سواء المتعلق بالانتخابات التشريعية الأخيرة في الجزائر التي تم تنظيمها يوم الثاني عشر من جوان 2021 أو كل المحطات والمراحل المرتبطة بالإصلاحات السياسية أعتقد لا يخفاكم أن الجزائر شهدت حراك شعبي كبير انطلق يوم 22 فبراير العام 2019 رفضا لامتداد حكم بوتفريقا لعهدة خامسة ولرحيل الكثير من رموز نظام الأسبق كما أسميته أستاذ خشيب نظام بوتفليقة ورحيل رموز هذا النظام بطبيعة الحال أن الوضع الجزائري كان مهم وأكد إذا تمكن دكتور سامي سيتراجلت بعض الأيديز فلنتحدث مقطعا بمقطع حتى تسهل الترجمة يعني بالنسبة للدكتور سامي أوكي تمام أولا البروفيسور سيد Uh, thank you very much. This is a very important topic, and I would like to thank you and thank my colleagues and those who are following us. This particular uh, topic is very important, and it's related to the elections that took place at the end of 2020 with the political reforms that were promised. It came after the uh, great movements, the Hirak, uh, the popular movements uh, since uh, February 2019, which uh, was staged uh, as a rejection of the continuation of Bouteflika, the former president, uh, to have a fifth term, and also uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, for, for getting rid of all the, the, the symbols and those who represented the old regime. وبالتالي هذا الحراك ارتبط بتراكمات كبيرة لمدة عشرين سنة من حكم الرئيس الأسبق عبد العزيز بوتفليقة. لكن الشيء الذي أريد أن أقوله هنا أن الجزائر شهدت الانفتاح الحقيقي على الديمقراطية سنة 1989 بناء على دستور 23 فبراير 1989 وهذا ارتبط بأحداث أكتوبر الخامس من أكتوبر 1989 التي طالبت بالانفتاح السياسي بالانفتاح السياسي والتعددية والجزائر في هذا الإطار شهدت الانتقال الديمقراطي وهي المرحلة الأولى لأنه في أدبيات الديمقراطية هناك مرحلتين للتحول الديمقراطي المرحلة الأولى هي الانتقال الديمقراطي والمرحلة الثانية هي الترسيخ الديمقراطي أو التعزيز الديمقراطي كما يوصف في الكثير من الأدبيات العربية وبالتالي ما أريد تأكيده هنا هو أن الجزائر شهدت الانتقال الديمقراطي سنة 1989 وبعد 30 سنة أي سنة 2019 توجهت نحو تعزيز الديمقراطية وبالتالي دخلت في المرحلة الثانية من التحول الديمقراطي. So this this Hirak this popular movement 
was much very much related to the 20 years of Bouteflika. After 20 years, uh, people were fed up with this and they wanted to change. And it was, but we have to realize that uh, uh, a democracy started in Algeria back with the adoption of the constitution in February 1989. And uh, uh, after also the, uh, the, the October events of 89, I don't know whether it's February or October, but it was said October, and which called for political openness and pluralism. And as you know, in, in, in the literature of democracy, that you go through two phases. The first phase is democratic transition, which actually took place back in 1989. And then the second phase come, which is to establish democracy, to be rooted in society. And that took 30 years in Algeria. And, uh, and this happened in 2019. ودخلت في عشرية سوداء عانت من ويلات الإرهاب لمدة عشر سنوات أي منذ 1991 إلى غاية 2001 فالجزائر شهدت إرهاب دموي كبير وهذا يرتبط بانفتاحها على الديمقراطية وتوجهها نحو تعزيز الديمقراطية لأن الغرب للأسف لا يريد لأي بلد من بلدان المشرق أو أي بلد من بلدان العالم العربي أو العالم الإسلامي أن يصبح قوة صاعدة وأن ينجح ديمقراطيا فالنجاح الديمقراطي غير مرغوب بالنسبة للغرب والغرب يريد دائما الديمقراطية المقصودة وهي التي يشتت بها ويقسم بها الدول العربية والإسلامية بمثل ما حدث في العراق أعتقد أن أمريكا دخلت العراق سنة 2003 لكن أمريكا لم تبني ديمقراطية في العراق وبالتالي الديمقراطية المقصودة من قبل الغرب ليست هي الديمقراطية المنشودة لدى الشعوب العربية والإسلامية So uh, Algeria paid a, a huge price to do this democratic transition after it went through the black 10 years, the black decade, uh, and, 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 and uh, suffered from terrorism between 1991 and 2001. Um, so this uh, openness to democracy has taken a great toll in Algeria. And uh, part of the problem, of course, is that the West doesn't want to the Arab world or to people in the, in the Middle East to actually uh, uh, have democracy, real democracy. What the West wants is a democracy that is being custom designed uh, for its interest as it happened in Iraq. Uh, America, when it entered and invaded Iraq did not build democracy. What they built was a, uh, uh, a shortened democracy that did not take into consideration uh, Iraq's interests. ولذلك أن المجتمع الجزائري يريد أن يبني ديمقراطية وطنية مرتبطة بالهوية الجزائرية وبالشخصية الجزائرية لأنها للأسف دفعت ثمن كبير جدا جراء العشرية السوداء بحيث تجاوزت ضحايا من الأفراد 250 ألف قتيل وتجاوزت الخسائر المادية 500 مليون مليار دولار إلى جانب أن عشرية سوداء أخرت الجزائر زمنيا على العالم كثيرا كثيرا ومع ذلك فهي حققت انتقال ديمقراطي لكن أيضا فترة حكم بالتفليقة وتراكماتها دفعت المجتمع بأن يسعى لتعزيز الديمقراطية والتوجه نحو الانتخابات الحقيقية وكانت أجندة الإصلاحات التي بشرها الرئيس عبد المعزيز تبون واضحة ومحددة المعالم so, uh, Algeria, Algerians... Wanted to go to and and to do the democratic transition, and uh, but it has to be based on the national identity, and the national identity of Algerians, and uh, Algeria has paid a tremendous price of two hundred and fifty thousand people during this uh, black decade, uh, lost almost five hundred billion dollars, and it it uh, uh, it, it made uh, Algeria going backward, uh, but uh, nevertheless it has uh, gone from this democratic transition as it went through elections, democratic elections in 2019, and adopted a, uh, a series of political reforms uh, by the current president, uh, Abdel Majid Tabou. And that's why the election of 2019 in February 2019 has been on three things. The Jewish people, the Jewish people, the Jewish people, and the Jewish people, في الحفاظ على الشعب والحفاظ على الدستور. 
وهذا الشيء غير مألوف في العالم العربي أو في إفريقيا أو في العالم الإسلامي بأن نشهد المؤسسة العسكرية تؤكد على أن لا مخرج للجزائر سوى المخرج الدستوري فهي كانت الحامي الأبرز للدستور وبالتالي هنا التجربة الجزائرية تقدمت وأصبحت نوعية أكثر وأكدت على إمكانية توجه الجزائر نحو الديمقراطية So the, uh, the Hirak, the popular movement of February 2019, has, um, has shown us three important features. One is that this Hirak was civil in nature, it was peaceful, and also it, uh, uh, it showed that the role of the uh, military establishment, the military uh, institution, uh, was set to preserve the constitution, which is, uh, which is not uh, typical in the Arab world or in the third world, where the uh, military establishment uh, insisted on having a constitutional uh, a solution to the crisis. Uh, it has proven to be the protector of the constitution. So the uh, Algerian experiment uh, has, has proven that uh, the military could actually become the institution that protects the constitution. وبعد الانتخابات الرئاسية التي تم تنظيمها يوم 12 ديسمبر 2019 أكد الرئيس عبد المجيد تبون في حملته الانتخابية على 54 التزام و54 التزام هي جاءت تيمنا بتاريخ اندلاع الثورة سنة 1954 ومن بين التزاماته هو تنظيم انتخابات تشريعية مسبقة والقيام بإصلاحات سياسية وتعديل الدستور بحيث تم مراجعة الدستور وتعديله بطريقة هامة وإعطاء لمسة دستورية جديدة في الجزائر تتعلق بإمكانية تحول النظام السياسي بين نظام برلماني ونظام رئاسي وهذا يرتبط دائما بنتائج الانتخابات التشريعية فإذا كانت انتخابات التشريعية تفرز أغلبية برلمانية معارضة لبرنامج رئيس الجمهورية فالنظام السياسي يصبح نظام برلماني والأغلبية البرلمانية تشكل الحكومة أما في حال تعدم حصول أي أغلبية أو حصول أغلبية رئاسية أي لها نفس برنامج رئيس الجمهورية فالنظام السياسي يكون نظام رئاسي ونذهب إلى وزير أول بدل تعيين رئيس حكومة So after the elections, after the presidential elections of 2019, the elected president of Boone uh, gave 54 commitments and he used the, the, the number 54 because the original Algerian revolution against the French took place in 1954. So he gave 54 commitments. And one of the, some of these commitments were to organize legislative elections, to do political reforms, to amend the constitution, and one of the most important amendments was to change the system so it will be both presidential and parliamentarian. Uh, so if the uh, results of the, of the legislative elections brings a majority from the opposition to the president, then they will form the government and they will have a, 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 someone who would be the uh, prime minister. So, uh, uh, leading the, 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 the government. But if the, if the system brings a, a, a majority that is in agreement with the president, then it becomes a presidential system. And then he will uh, appoint a first uh, minister who will lead the government, but under the uh, president. ولذلك أن الانتخابات التشريعية الأخيرة جاءت في إطار أجندة إصلاحات رئيس الجمهورية وجاءت كمطلب شعبي لأنه لا ننكر هنا في الجزائر كمجتمع جزائري أن البرلمان السابق كان مرفوض لأنه بين قوسين يوصف ببرلمان شكارة وشكارة هنا بالعملية الجزائرية تعني المال الفاسد أو أصحاب المال الفاسد الذين يشترون المناصب وهنا كان المجتمع الجزائري يرفضهم وطالب بضرورة حل البرلمان وذهب إلى انتخابات تشريعية مسبقة والشيء المميز في الجزائر أن ما يسمى التزوير أو الحديث عن التزوير أصبح غير موجود لأنه تم استحداث سلطة مستقلة للانتخابات وهذه السلطة نجحت في ثلاث محطات المحطة الأولى هي الانتخابات الرئاسية يوم 12 ديسمبر 2019 المحطة الثانية هي الاستفتاء على الدستور 
يوم الفاتح من نوفمبر 2020 والمحطه الثالثه هي نجاحها في تنظيم الانتخابات التشريعيه يوم 12 جوان 2021. So the legislative election, the legislative elections came as a popular demand and as a result of the political reforms of the president. And what we have today is a real parliament, unlike the old parliaments that were corrupt. It came as a result of uh, 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 corrupt money. And, uh, and, and that's why people were asking to dissolve the parliament. Uh, what Algeria today has is does not have uh, elections fraud. The elections are fair and, and uh, true and they're not fraudulent. And uh, uh, we see today that uh, this happened through three stages. First, the election of the president, then the referendum on the constitution in 2020, and then finally with the legislative elections taking place recently. ولذلك فانتخابات 12 جوان الماضي في الانتخابات التشريعية أول شيء تؤكد على أن الجزائر من ضمن الدول القلائل في العالم التي استطاعت تنظيم انتخابات في ظل جائحة كورونا فتم تنظيم الاستفتاء في ظل جائحة كورونا والانتخابات التشريعية في جائحة كورونا وربما حتى هناك انتخابات محلية مسبقة سوف يتم تنظيمها الأشهر المقبلة وهذا راجع إلى فعالية التزامات رئيس الجمهورية بالقيام بهذه الإصلاحات والتوجه نحو ضخ دماء جديدة في المجالس المنتخبة. So we see today that the elections that were last June, the legislative elections, uh, certainly demonstrated that Algeria is among the few countries that were able to organize uh, uh, fair elections uh, within, uh, even we have Corona, the, the, uh, the pandemic, and uh, also they are going forward with local elections soon, which shows that the president is keeping his commitments. رغم أن المشاركة الانتخابية سواء في استفتاء على الدستور أو حتى في الانتخابات التشريعية كانت بسيطة فنسبة المشاركة في الانتخابات التشريعية كانت 23% لكن بالنسبة لنا كجزائريين أن المشاركة المحتشمة في الانتخابات أفضل من الانقلاب على الدستور أو غيرها من الممارسات التي تشهدها الكثير من الدول سواء في تونس أو في مصر وغيرها وهذا يعود يعني لا نسميه بالمقاطعة الانتخابية ولا نسميه بالامتناع التصويت وإنما هو حالة انقطاع يحتاج إلى مرحلة زمنية من أجل تعزيز الثقافة الانتخابية لدى المجتمع الجزائري والتوجه نحو تعزيز قيم المواطنة So even though the participation in the elections was very low, to about 23%, but for Algerians, this is better than uh, having a coup against the constitution. Uh, we cannot call it as being a boycott, but it has to do with the, with the culture uh, uh, of, of participation, which, is, which has not been great in Algeria. It would take time, but we can look at this as being part of the education political education that the Algerian people will have to go through to participate in large numbers. In the case of this, we can see that the percentage of the participants is very important, and the results of the elections have been kept on the same way that the government of 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 خاصة حركة مجتمع السلم وتقدم كبير جدا للأحرار كونهم مستقلين لا ينتمون لهذه الأحزاب وكتلة الأحرار عشية ترز نتائج الانتخابات وظهور الأسماء الرسمية وتأكيد المجلس الدستوري عليها أن على أنها سليمة أن الأحرار ساندوا رئيس الجمهورية في برنامجهم في برنامج الانتخابي وحتى أن رئيس المجلس الشعب الوطني كان من كتلة الأحرار ورئيس من الشعب الوطني في النظام السياسي في الجزائر هو الرجل الثالث في الدولة أي بعد رئيس الجمهورية ورئيس مجلس الأمة يأتي رئيس المجلس الشعب الوطني كرجل ثالث في الدولة وهو رجل مستقل غير متحزب ولا ينتمي إلى الأحزاب. So we could see that even though the participation was low, but we also see that the traditional parties, particularly the National Front. Uh, even though they, they scored some gains, but we also see others, particularly from the Islamists, who have uh, gained uh, many members in the current parliament, 
as well as new groups such as the the uh, al ahrar or the, the the maybe the liberation front i don't know what they are called uh, but they are uh, uh, they have become an important part of the political system as uh, their leader has become the the speaker of that house and uh, uh, constitutionally, he is the third person in the country, the third uh, person in terms of uh, power and position after the, 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 the president of the uh, Ummah Council uh, and, and the president himself. ولذلك لو نعود لنقيم النظام الانتخابي الجزائري على ضوء الانتخابات التشريعية الماضية يمكن أن نقول أن النظام الانتخابي شهد ثلاث أشياء أول شيء هي على أن هذه الانتخابات هي انتخابات حرة انتخابات نزيهة لا, لا تشكيك فيها وانتخابات منتظمة أكدت دائما على احترام السلطات الجزائرية للعهدة الانتخابية وعدم خلق الأسباب لتحطيمها أو تنظيم انتخابات تحت ظروف أخرى وإنما تنظيم هذه الانتخابات جاء بناء على مطلب شعب وأخيرا أن هذه الانتخابات جاءت في سياق إصلاحات سياسية ومن ثم في الجزائر نجحت كثيرا في قطع العلاقة مع التزوير والتأكيد دائما على أن الصندوق الانتخابي ليس شاهد زور وإنما هو صندوق انتخابي يعكس الإرادة الشعبية وخاصة أن الوعاء الانتخابي في الجزائر في حدود 25 مليون ناخب لكن الصندوق دائما يحترم الإرادة الشعبية والانتخابات التشريعية الأخيرة أكدت على اختيار الشعب حتى ولو كانت نسبة مشاركة بسيطة so what we so to to evaluate what's happening in Algeria and looking at the political system, we could see that there are three important uh, features. One is that uh, Algeria had free and fair and on time elections, and that the authorities uh, uh, have respected elections and they did not postpone uh, based on the popular demand uh, within the framework of political reforms. And that the, uh, uh, the fraudulent elections are no longer the case in Algeria, but the, the elections actually are reflections of the popular will, even though we have 25 million uh, uh, citizens who are eligible to vote, but only uh, uh, a portion of them, a small portion of them actually participated, but it, it uh, reinforced the fact that these are free, fair uh, elections uh, that have taken place. ولذلك ختاما يمكن أن نقول أن الفعل الانتخابي في الجزائر يسعى دائما إلى تعزيز قيم المواطنة الإيجابية من خلال أربعة أشياء أو شيء المسؤولية الاجتماعية ثم نتحدث على قيمة العدالة كقيمة أيضا يرتبط ترتبط بالمجتمع وترتبط بقوة الدولة ثم نتحدث على الحرية من خلال التوجه نحو تعزيز الحريات ثم نتحدث دائما على حقوق الإنسان بما فيها الحق في الانتخاب ومع ذلك أن النظام الانتخابي في الجزائر يحتاج دائما إلى متابعة وإلى تطوير فهناك الكثير من التحفظات داخل الوطن من قبل المعارضة والنظام السياسي هو مجبر على التعامل مع هذه النقاط الخلافية والنظام السياسي ينبغي له أن يتنازل أمام الكثير من المطالب سواء المتعلقة بسبيل المثال بأن رئيس الجمهورية هو من يختار رئيس السلطة المستقلة لتنظيم الانتخابات أو فيما يتعلق بصلاحيات رئيس الجمهورية أو استكمال الكثير من الإصلاحات السياسية ولذلك هنا نجد الجزائر مجبرة في حلقة ثالثة بعد الانتخاب أو بعد الاستفتاء على الدستور والانتخابات التشريعية الذهاب إلى انتخابات محلية تشمل ولايات الجزائر أو المقاطعات الجزائر وتشمل أيضا البلديات في الإطار المحلي وهنا تستطيع الجزائر على الأقل أن تؤسس لثلاث أنواع من الديمقراطية الديمقراطية التشاركية في الإطار المحلي والديمقراطية التمثيلية في البرلمان والديمقراطية المباشرة من خلال انتخاب رئيس الجمهورية فرئيس الجمهورية يبقى رمز من رموز الجمهورية ويعكس دائما الإرادة الشعبية. 
So uh, in conclusion, we could see that the, uh, the elections in Algeria has reinforced the values or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the values of citizenship uh, uh, within four different categories, classifications, the social responsibility, justice and fair and free elections, the freedom uh, as the new constitution uh, is, is going to reinforce more uh, personal and community freedoms, as well as human rights, uh, including the right to elect and be elected. The, uh, the regime also needs to uh, uh, adopt more of the demands by the, by the opposition, uh, particularly some of the differences taking place about who would appoint the, uh, the head of government and uh, we could see uh, finally that there are three kinds of democracy or democratic systems in Algeria. Uh, the participatory democracy, as we see within the local elections, the representative democracy, as we've seen in the legislative elections, and the direct democracy, which is the uh, election of the president, uh, which, uh, which embodies uh, popular will. Will uh, انه نستطيع ان نقول الجزائر تستطيع ان تتحول الى مناره ديمقراطيه في المنطقه رغم انه التجاذبات الدوليه ومحاوله الاختراق من طرف المستعمر السابق كفرنسا او بعض الممارسات الخاصه بالدول العربيه التي ترفض نجاح الديمقراطيه في الجزائر لانها تتخوف من انتقال العدوى لها خاصه الانظمه الملكيه والانظمه التسلطيه التي تتخوف من ان تنقلب عليهم شعوبهم مطالبه بالديمقراطيه فالتجربه الجزائريه اليوم هي ناجحه لكنها تحتاج الى التماسك تحتاج الى تعزيز الانفتاح على الراي والراي الاخر تحتاج ايضا دائما الى الاستفاده من التجارب الدوليه سواء في التوجه نحو الديمقراطيه او الانفتاح ايضا على المشاريع التنمويه ولذلك الجزائر تستطيع ان تكون تجربه مهمه يستفيد منها الكثير من الشعوب سواء في العالم العربي او في افريقيا واخيرا اشكركم جميعا كل باسمه ومقامه اجدد شكري للاستاذ جلال خشيب واشكركم شكر خاص اخي الفاضل الاستاذ سامي على هذه الترجمه <تصفيق> So uh, uh, Algeria is capable, in conclusion, Algeria is capable of becoming a beacon of democracy in the area, in, in the region, uh, despite the policies of some of the imperialist or colonialist powers, such as uh, France or other regional powers, who don't like to see uh, a democracy in Algeria or even in the region, because they think when that happens, uh, their own people will topple them. So they fight uh, democracy. Uh, what Algeria needs also is uh, more openness towards the, the, uh, the opposition to the other opinions, as well as to benefit from uh, other uh, experiences and experiments, international ones, and also to adopt more of development projects. And uh, when that happens, Algeria will become a, a model for the Arab world as well as uh, for Africa. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, uh, inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Idris, for this presentation. And a great thanks to uh, our professor, Dr. Sami, for this uh, translation. Uh, so uh, it's obvious, obvious that uh, Dr. Idris uh, believed that uh, Algeria going toward such gradual democratic change and they also said that Algeria will be uh, like an attractive uh, model for other for other nations especially in Arab world uh, and he see this this is a normal uh, like normal process for democracy first of all democratic transition then democratic like establishing the establishing democracy in Algeria. And this is a logic uh, uh, page of, uh, of change. So let's move to uh, our doctor, Tim Hinan Al-Qabi, and uh, bring such, uh, such questions and conclusion to her. Uh, doctor, uh, doctor Al-Qabi, so how, uh, besides what, uh, what Dr. Idris said and argue, so how you evaluate this, uh, this path 
since the Hirak. And uh, especially these two years of uh, Abdel Majid Tabun as the president of Algeria with his promise to enter to a new Algeria, Al Jazeera Al The floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jalal, for, for your question and the invitation. Uh, yeah, I think it's a very important question. Uh, however, like just to make it very clear, and, and it's interesting because I think we'll have a very rich debate. I, I strongly disagree with many of the points made by uh, Dr. Adia. I think it's a very optimistic reading of the situation, if I, I can say that. Well, I will start. I think, you know, these debates can be extremely ideological ideological and political. And I think for the sake of science and the respect of political science as a discipline, we should answer this question by starting with a definition. What is democracy and what is democratic consolidation? And then accordingly, we can assess if Algeria is going through a democratic transition or is not. And, and so from what we know broadly in, in political science, we define democracy as a, a form of government where the people rule. So the, the power belongs to the people, right? And, and we, we measure it traditionally through, through voting, through the freedom and transparency of elections. We also assess it through participation rate, which is not marginal, uh, and also according to other values, like you know, respect of freedom of speech, respect of the rights of assembly, uh, and, and all different like political rights uh, that are out there. And if we take these components into account, well, I think it's very hard to make the argument that Algeria is going through a democratic transition. And so if, if we just start with the simple fact that, you know, the, the power is supposed to belong to the people, well, I think arguably it's very clear as it stands in Algeria from its constitution, its new constitution, which was voted in in November 2020, that power still heavily relies within the military institution. The army in the country is the true power holder. The organization of the December 2019 presidential elections were clearly a decision that emanated from former chief of staff, General Ahmed Gaid Saleh, who decided that the outcome of the popular uprising should be the organization of these elections. And we knew beforehand that uh, Mr. Abdel Majid Taboon was his favorite candidate. So I think it's very hard to make the argument that this process was transparent and emanated from popular will, because just empirically looking at the images, there were tens of thousands of Algerians, both in Algeria uh, and abroad, contesting this electoral process. I think it's hard to narrow down democracy in the election, in the organization of elections. There are thousands uh, of instances where we saw the organization of elections in authoritarian contexts. I don't think we should have this narrow vision of what democracy is. I mean, we've been organizing elections during Bouteflika's era. Did it mean that it was democratic and that Algeria was a democracy? I doubt it. Now, when we talk about like democratic consolidation, there is you know, definitions for that. And then there's the famous Huntington definition of the uh, test of the two turnarounds. It's the idea that you need to have two free and fair elections and passation of power happening consecutively. And Algeria has not seen that. Uh, we've seen uh, very much like uh, a positioning by the military institution trying to concentrate powers after Bouteflika stepped down and the organizations of elections which you know were contested by, by, by many people and so actually the lowest turnout uh, in Algeria's history in terms of presidential elections so I think this is all very problematic but then if we move away from the vision of elections and try and, and assess democratic rights. Because as I said, democracy is not just the organization of elections. It's also democratic rights, political rights, civil rights, and so on. Well, in terms of freedom of assembly, uh, the situation has arguably gone worse. And I'm just trying to look at empirics. 
we have several recognized, legally recognized political parties within the opposition that have been systematically facing challenges by the central regime. There is the example uh, of the uh, RCD party. Uh, there is uh, currently, as we're speaking, the leader and the president of a political party, a recognized political party. That's the uh, MDS, Democratic and Social Movement, party who's actually in jail for practicing politics within a legal framework. So uh, also when we talk about freedom of expression, uh, we're seeing journalists currently arrested and, and being suppressed just for the practice of, of their rights. So currently in Tamil Rasid, uh, Rabah Kawash is in jail, has been in jail for over three months uh, for writing a press article. So if we take all these components into account, uh, I, I think it's very hard to see that Algeria is going through a democratic process and like through further democratic consolidation. Um, I think that an important point is in the constitution. Constitutions very much shape political environments and determine the distribution of power. And this is a very important way of assessing to what extent a country is democratic or not. And if we take a look at the latest Algerian uh, constitution, which was voted in November 2020, we can see that there is a clear concentration of powers around the person of the president. So uh, Dr. Atia was uh, talking about, you know, the new parliament that we have in the legislative elections. The truth is that the parliament in Algeria has very little political power. It is not an institution that has the capacity to, to, to change things. I mean, the, the president still has the upper hand over the, the parliament, the judiciary, uh, and also the, the executive. So what we're seeing, you know, many analysts have, have looked at this latest constitutions and argue that it was one of the most authoritarian in the Mediterranean in terms of concentrations of power. And so uh, I think this is like very important indicators or, of where things are heading. A very important point, and that was a novelty in the latest constitution, is that for the first time, it recognized the political role of the army. And this is in Article 30. So historically, the Algerian army always played a heavy role in politics. Uh, this decreased a bit during Bouteflika's era where the uh, military civilian relations uh, tweaked and shifted towards the, the presidency where Bouteflika tried to concentrate powers. Uh, but we saw that the army was coming back uh, in this new constitution. And it's the first one in Algeria's history. So since independence in 1962, where the role of the army is recognized as de jure. So we see that uh, the article states that the army has the right to intervene in the strategic, uh, to defend the strategic interests of the state, but strategic is not defined. So strategic could be choosing a president, <laughs> it could be choosing who would make it to parliament and who doesn't. So it's very vague. And obviously we know that like, uh, this vagueness is not, is not an accident, right? It's politically motivated because it, it gives room to the army to, to intervene in the country's political life. Uh, what we saw in the latest parliamentary elections was a, a clear failure by many standards. So uh, Dr. Adia described the latest parliament uh, under Bouteflika as being extremely corrupt and uh, not recognized by the Algerian people, which is completely true. But the composition of the latest parliament is not any different. We saw that the FLN, the historical party, still gained the majority, uh, followed by the RND, which is like uh, a copy of the FLN. And these parties have been strong supporters of Bouteflika. And they're coming back to power. So there was no real renewal of the political class. And this is mainly due to the fact that the Herag, the, the popular movement which started in Algeria in uh, 2019, very much rejected this process. For many Algerians, and here I'm sorry, it's not scientific, I'm just saying many, 
And this is because we can't really do surveys in Algeria. And this is due to the authoritarian nature of the state. It's illegal to go as a researcher, as a political scientist and survey people on why they vote, why they don't vote, what they think about these elections, about these political parties. We, we don't have that data. And so what we can say though, from, from what we've seen uh, during popular protests, but also on social media, is that people very much see these elections as a, a way for the regime to, to, to come back to power, to, to you know, it's, it's facade change. It's not deep, meaningful political change that would allow Algeria to have a genuine democracy uh, that, that, you know, would defend its sovereignty. And uh, I'm not defending here by any means. And I want to make this very clear because often in those debates, people who are like pro-democratic change are often castigated as like pro-Western puppets, but this is not the debate. Like I think that a, a genuine democratic regime would actually help consolidate Algeria's sovereignty. Uh, because currently, you know, when we don't have internal legitimacy, we tend to seek external legitimacy. And, and this is what we're seeing with, you know, the Algerian regime having very close ties still to, to Paris, uh, despite uh, the narrative, the constructed narrative uh, that's being sold on, on public media, state controlled media. Uh, so, so what I was saying is that many Algerians see this process as just yet another ruse, another strategy by the regime to survive to power. And uh, the, th this is very much represented by the turnover rates that have been extremely low. Uh, we witnessed, yeah, like 20% of Algerians participating. And these are the, the lowest rates ever. And these are official rates. And, and there was actually a lot of, of you know, comments and criticism about how transparent the process was. So uh, your previous guest mentioned that the Islamists made progress. Actually, the MSP, the Islamist party he's mentioning, uh, criticized the process for being fraudulent. So uh, Mokri, actually the head of the MSP, uh, said publicly that uh, his party uh, won more seats than he actually got. And so there was a lot of, of cheating. This new um, organization called the, um, um, you know, the independent, uh, like the independent organization of elections committee. Um, I don't know what's the name. There is an independent body now controlling elections, but the head of it, uh, Mr. Shorfi, was Bouteflika's former minister of justice. And he's known for having participated in you know cheating uh, in previous elections and in you know kind of defending the previous corrupt regime so it is hard to make the ar argument that with the same people you know with Taboon being himself a previous prime minister to Bouteflika that we can build something new and fresh out of these people who, who were clearly part of, of the regime uh, the, the, the other point I want to make outside of the politics is the country's dire economic and social situation. So Algeria, since the drop of oil prices in 2014, has been struggling economically. But lately, the, the situation with, with COVID-19 and so on has, has deepened, like the, the crisis has very much deepened. And we're witnessing, uh, you know, extreme um, poverty rates uh, and, and really instances of, of hunger and, and you know, a, a really dire economic situation. And the problem is that the current government, because of its lack of legitimacy, has been completely unable to find solutions to the demands of the Algerian people. Uh, we've seen that rates of Haraga, these are illegal migrants, young people crossing the Mediterranean has increased sharply, and we have data on that uh, from our uh, European neighbors. Uh, and, and, and we've seen most lately and most tragically, the complete incompetence of the government in dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. So Algeria is going through a very severe third peak. As we're speaking, 
thousands of people are uh, dying every day. Uh, official data is very scant and unreliable, uh, but Algerians did not find a government that was able to, to answer the, their needs or to, to, to present any solutions or reassuring efforts in detail. And, and so it's very problematic because when the president gets sick, and this is just empirics, he went lately uh, as of November 2020 to Germany to, to get treated from his uh, COVID-19 infection. However, the Algerians are left without a healthcare system. And this is a, a very problematic situation. So just to sum up and to leave more space to the debate, which I'm sure is gonna be interesting, uh, Algeria did not unfortunately go through a democratic transition. Uh, the Herak very much asked for a radical rupture from uh, the previous practices. However, what we saw is an attempt of the political system to uh, survive to power. And there was the organization of uh, facade elections. This includes the presidential election, the uh, referendum about the new constitution and the latest parliamentary elections. Um, these did not have any political weight. Algerians did not participate in these elections. And um, it, to, to move forward, there is a need for a genuine dialogue between the regime and the opposition to find a consensual route for genuine and meaningful political change. I will stop here. Thank you, Dr. Tinhinan, for this amazing presentation. So uh, now uh, we have our third guest, Dr. Abdel Noor, and I think he is in, in trouble now uh, because he is finding himself now between two very different points of views. Uh, Dr. Idris said and argued that uh, Algeria is moving now toward democracy and it's gonna be like uh, a model for other, for others, an attractive model for others uh, in democracy and a new experience, with, and we will uh, teach others what does mean democracy and democratic transitions. But uh, Dr. Uh, Al Qadi, opposite now, and Algeria, we we are we are now in front of what she said. A facade democracy, a democracy yet to So, be, beside beside the answering this question, Doctor uh, Doctor uh, Abdel Noor, so uh, I would like uh, also to to know your perspective about uh, regarding the uh, the, the the Islamic movement exactly and civil society. So, just I'm trying to to benefit from your your fresh book. Uh, which published this year. Dr. Abdenur, the mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jalal. Uh, thank you, uh, the, the, my dear colleague, distinguished uh, panelist here with me. Uh, as you said, actually, I am in a big, big trouble because <laughs> I have to break through these two interesting point of views of my dear colleagues. Uh, and actually, it's very interesting because it will lead to the title of my book, which is From Hope to Uncertainty for the Anatomy of Algerian Harak. And I think this is what has been going on for the last two years. Uh, before I will ask uh, answer to your question on the uh, latest uh, evolution or the evolution of the Islamist movement in the Algerian, uh, I would say, uh, post FIS or ex fees dynamic or trajectory than the during the uh, Bouteflika uh, era. I think it's very interesting point also I wanted to touch on because when we speak about Bouteflika, it's not ex president Bouteflika. It's not really a regime, it was a system. As we say in Arabic, uh, actually it was yani, uh, the regime in Algeria is still intact. 
since uh, 1962, even, even though the steps or the dates that marked the Algerian uh, regime, which was, I think, three or four important times, uh, 1965, uh, 1967, 1992, and then in 2019. All these stages, I think, are important to uh, at least uh, mention, even though we don't have uh, the time to go through all the details. Uh, now, as far as the uh, democratic process in Algeria, and then as I said, I have to position myself between my two dear uh, colleagues and the, on their points of view, maybe the age and some, because when we get older, we get uh, wiser, because I, am, I belong to the generation of 1989. And uh, I agree fully with uh, Dr. Afia that was the constitution of 1989 that opened the, or cleared up clearly the political process in Algeria. And unfortunately, the uh, democratic process didn't go through at that time. It was aborted. And to be honest also and uh, clear and fair with our viewers and followers and uh, ourselves, it was a tragic coup that ended the democratic process that was going through, I will say, a learning process at that moment, because Algerians, I mean, have the culture of militancy and political awareness, consciousness, et cetera, and that goes to from, from now to a century. So we're not going to, uh, I mean, spend much time on this, but that period of 1989 and with the constitution, I would again, humbly say it and uh, mentioned it in my previous writings that was, that constitu constitution was, first of all, was a real constitution, meaning by that a constitution of law. As we say, c'est une constitution, Du droit, and in French, unlike the previous constitution of 1976, that was a constitution of program. It was like I say in Arabic, barnamage, and the system wasn't the same because at that time we we spoke about when we say that if we coach Montesquieu about the separation of the three powers, I mean we we. In that moment, I mean, it was clearly in the constitution of 1976, they were called wadaif functions, and wadaif thalat, the, the executive function, the legislative uh, function, and the judiciary function. But in, 2000, in, in 1989, the constitution of the Second Republic was clearly for, I mean, they, for the separation of power, and that allowed the uh, legality of the political parties that the majority or all of them, besides the unique party, the FLN, who was the legally recognized and was the ruling party of the country. But the other parties, they existed and they had behind them, I mean, like 30, uh, that moment, like 25, 30 years of clandestinity. And here it's a very interesting element I would like to touch on but to understand what's going on in these days. And even during the Herak times the, of 2019, and then the uh, situation or the uh, implications that came to, or emerged from this Herak. And here is about the political parties. When we spoke here about political parties, those political parties post Again, the 1992 coup and the constitution of 19, uh, of 19, I believe, 96. And then the arrival of President, ex President Bouteflika to power. That, I mean, we have to understand this. And I think there's not going to be a scoop because I bless Bouteflika. He, did it. he never left the power because he's one of the designers of the Algerian regime. So he made that kind of 10 year. Uh, let's say journey, but he came uh, uh, strongly to power. So my point is about the political leaders, 
despite their ideology differences and agenda strategy and objective, how they will uh, conquer to power indeed legally via elections. But listen carefully. I mean, this is not an order, but just I mean, you have to, to focus all with me on this point. The leaders of those political parties at that moment, I'm talking about the period of 1990, uh, 1992. We had Ahmed Bimbella, we had Abdul Hamid Mahri, we had Ayat Ahmed, we had Abbasi Madani, we had Sheikh Nahnah, we had Amirat, and so on. In 2019, what, do, what did we have? Seriously. Okay, with all my respect to those leaders, I whether I mean FFS, they had their leaders, the FLN, it's another story, even the Islamists. Now, uh, Dr. Jalal, to come to your question about the evolution of the Islamist movement or the Islamist parties. The Islamist parties, they are today in a deep political crisis because of their, I mean, let's say faux pas, and to some extent was almost a political suicide that committed under the, 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 the Bouteflika system. And here, but it was purposely done by Bouteflika because Bouteflika, ex-president, on my respect to the person, Abdelaziz, ex-president Abdelaziz Bouteflika, when he came to power, he knew well how those parties functions. With, again, so what he did, he applied very simple strategy, divide and ampera. And he applied his strategy to all the, all the three main ideologies in the, in, in the political spectrum. He touched the first the Islamist, he divided them into three, four, five, six uh, parties, and then created even micro parties. He went to the nationalists, he did the same thing, he enhanced the Euro fight between the RD and the FLA. And he did the same, uh, I mean, he, same strategy with the so called liberal parties or left parties. So these, uh, let's say, poor performances had pushed to some extent the voter, I would say the voter, I would say all the Algerians, to hate politics and democracy for them was a curse. I mean, I, of course, I give you this. I left the country 32 years ago, but I'm in contact daily with Algeria. And I'm in contact daily with my, with my roots. And I know what Algerians are saying. I, maybe someone says, okay, or someone's okay, you are living abroad, you don't know what's going on. No, I know what's going on because I speak daily with uh, Algerians. So what made them hate politics is the behavior of the politicians, including the Islamists. And if today, I mean, the Islamists were having like solid, uh, say bulk or like electoral reservoir that goes between 30 to 35%. Today, we don't see this. Even though like the late election or latest elections of you know, the last June, I mean, the Islamists, they made, I would say kind of like timid, uh, victory, but still, I mean, knowing the sociology of the country, knowing the, uh, their implementations in the society and of, of course their power. So it's poor results. So that goes for the nationalists. Now back to the FLN. So what happened to the FLN and that to be frank with you was also a surprise because I didn't think we were expecting that the FLN party will come first. It did come first. Why? Because again, sociologically, the FLN were implemented and also uh, like clone in the society. And also we are missing the point here about the boycott. Let's, I mean, let's be frank. I mean, boycott is a boycott and people, again, they are not voting because they don't trust politicians. And they are tired, sick and tired of politics. Because in the end of the day, they will say, okay, I, I mean, I just in my level, 
I tried to lead like interviews with like basic people. I said, why don't you go to vote? I mean, there is change. I mean, this is not the same. Look, people, are, I mean, you have this, let's say category of ages that belong to your generation. Okay, I am old. I mean, I'm not expecting anything. I wish just the best for my country, but I'm not hoping for anything else. But you, it's the future. So, you know, my future, my future is elsewhere, as uh, Dr. mentioned about the Harga or the Haraga. This is very, very, very like sad story. So therefore the situation or the current situation, which is in a blurry situation, but who made this situation? I mean, they cannot break through are two responsible, the political parties and to some extent, the elite. When I, say, when I speak about the elite, including the media, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, how, what's their, the, I mean, their ideology orientations or their agenda, but they didn't help the process, meaning by this, this learning process. It is true. I mean, Algerians are open to freedom and are hungry and thirsty for freedom. And they want uh, to, uh, the, the, the democratic process to succeed or to excel to, to some extent. But it has to be with credible, let's say, uh, delivery, because there is nobody to deliver to them. And also we are missing another point. When we mentioned about the President Taboon, President Taboon, he, I mean, officially doesn't have a party. I mean, he pre pre presented himself to the voters as an independent. Okay, we're not going to argue. Okay, he is uh, one of the regime's sons and he spent all his career. That's another story. But he doesn't have a political party to lay on or to, to lay on. So he understands also those political parties. And if you are, I mean, if you are paying attention to his tactic, he's trying to discredit more like Abdelaziz Bouteflika did with the political parties, not to divide them, but to some extent weaken them. And his uh, force now is the so-called civil society groups or associations that he's trying to put them in front seat, which is good if he excelled. But the problem with this, democracy needs like an intermediary bodies that can help this process, this learning process that we call it democracy. And when we speak about democracy, indeed it's about the law of rule or according to the Anglo-Saxon definition or to the uh, French definition of l'état de droit. How are you going to implement, implement this? Of course, I think I heard in one of uh, our, uh, uh, my dear speaker, uh, colleagues, he said about the uh, political culture. So political culture is important. And as I said, Algerians are politically, uh, aware and they have that sense of political consciousness, but to some extent are not really responsible. They're not responsible or they don't want to be responsible. I mean, here between the three main, the masses, the elite and the political parties, even though the political party, they belong to some extent to the elite, but here to blame or to put all the blame on the regime, that is still, you have the right to criticize the regime. But the regime knows well this, the, the regime knows the masses and knows the elite and the political parties. This is why when we say like, okay, Algeria is not going to be a democracy or will be, or to see like, I mean, we can like portray a very dark picture about democracy. Of course, if you are expecting a democracy like, the French de democracy or the American democracy or the German or the British democracy. I think we have, we will wait for that, but it is something positive is coming through this dynamic. So this or this dynamic that is pushing the trajectory of the desire of change. The problem with this, as uh, Professor Atiyah mentioned earlier, like there is this the transition democracy and then 
the implementation democracy. How we're going to implement this? The problem now today, we are in, I agree, we are in the second step, but the problem we cannot, or we couldn't, when we say we, I'm putting in, in brackets, I mean, we, the people or the, the voters, we still don't find who's going to implement this project. Who's going to help us, we, the average person, the voters, to go and vote like with my own consciousness without having any doubt, even a reproach to the outcome. Because the Algerians, Algerians usually in general are cynical about politics, like in every way, even in sports are cynical about anything, but which is fine. I mean, this is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. However, they need, I'm not saying they need someone to teach them because they are smart. They have the capacity of thinking. They know what's going on around them, but what they need, they need just to be guided positively. And how I'm going to put this? I'm sorry, uh, General, I think I'm out of time. I, I, Dr. Abdelnour, uh, because our colleague, uh, Tin Hinan, uh, must leave, and she, because she has another meeting now. Uh, so I, I would like to, to stop with you here in positive. Just one minute, <laughs> positive one minute. Point, and I'm going to return to you to clarify this, uh, this point. I would like to benefit it from uh, her presence now with two or three questions before uh, she leaves. But this is technical problem, as we say back home. <laughs> Thank you for your understanding. I I come back to you. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Doctor Abdenor, for this for this presentation. Uh, and yeah, no, just one point. I'm going to end up with this. I'm going to sum up this. <laughs> okay, okay. So yeah, okay. I mean, what we are saying again to be in the position between the two, uh, my two dear uh, colleagues' uh, point of views, I think the key word here is compromises. And this is the problem. For all the parties, they still don't understand the meaning of compromises in politics. Everyone is still eager and to some extent uh, attached to his, her ideas. But this is not going to work. If we continue on this, path, we will not, I mean, we will not have democracy and, I mean, the civilians, and this is, will enhance the military. Okay, thank, th thank you, Dr. Radenor. Uh, Dr. Sami, if you don't have any question to our colleague Tin Hinan, so let me, let me ask, because I have three questions to, ha to her. I do have so, a question, but I will, answer, I will ask it after you ask yours, and maybe she can put them all together. Okay, okay. So, uh, Dr. Tinminan, before you leave us, so I would like just to uh, to benefit from you, from your works uh, regarding the relationships between the economic and, uh, and uh, political change and democracy. And I think you have, uh, you have some studies and I see some uh, articles about that. So uh, now uh, all of us, now that Algerian regime based in his policy, in his uh, survive on the frontier, on the oil and petrol and the gas, which called the frontier states. And now we are witnessing like a decline of this uh, such uh, frontier states. So do you think what's happened now in Algeria uh, and uh, in, in the, the importance of frontier in our world now. Do you think that this is what's pushing, what what is pushing now the, the political regime to make such insights, such self uh, self changing now? And what's happened now to like uh, uh, go into elections, putting some. Uh, some generals and leaders in the prisons and bringing another ones. So very huge uh, and deep changes now uh, happened inside the regime, inside the regime. Do you think the reason here is economics? This is the first question. The second one, uh, lots of people when they, when they, when they uh, 
here you hear your 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 such presentations uh, and they said argue that this speech is like uh, they described it like nihilist spe uh, speech which make like uh, harsh critical critics to the regime and to the political changes now process in Algeria without suggest rational alternatives. So how do you think the change in political regime or situation in Algeria will uh, should be uh, with, with such nihilist uh, speech? So, and the third one, the third question, you mentioned in your presentation uh, the, the, that, the, the, that the relationships between this regime, Algerian regime, the current one, and the France is very close now, uh, contrary to what they claim. So what are your indications now? What are your indications? And especially, uh, you know that in military term, the relationships with Russia is very high, in economics with China. So where is France here now in this, in this period? Where is France? What are your indications? So, and how France uh, could uh, uh, obstacle the democratic process in Algeria? This is my question. Sorry, Dr. Sami. <laughs> Well, very well. I don't know if you can answer all of them in five minutes, but I will ask, I will ask them anyways. And if she finds them interesting, she can answer them. And very quickly, what is the role of the military now in Algeria? Second is who rules Algeria now, in your opinion? And third, what future awaits uh, Algerians? What are the, the possible scenarios, particularly after the pandemic subsides? Uh, are we going to see another Iraq or, or the, or, are Algerians tired? and they will just let that process take its course from your point of view. Okay, thanks for all your questions, uh, all very interesting. And thanks for the two previous presentations. Uh, well, I will start with Jalal's questions. So um, I will start with the one on economic, like the, the link between the economic and the political. And here, I think this is where the, the, I think most of my worries come from because the, the economic situation is objectively dire. I know we have data to assess it. So for instance, if we just look at our foreign reserves, it was 2014, we had around $200 billion in foreign reserves, which gave the state the capacity to redistribute, to buy social peace, you know, to subsidize a lot of basic goods. And this very much contributed to like keeping Algeria peaceful throughout the so-called Arab Spring, right? Like there was subsidized housing, fuel, um, basic food, food, um, and so on. And now, uh, in the latest assessment, I think it seems that we have less than forty billion US dollars in foreign reserves. And that's very little. And when you look uh, at the, the current trends in terms of like oil and gas prices, it's true that sometimes they go up at the moment, oil prices are slightly higher than, than um, expected, but then the, the longer term trends are towards a decline of hydrocarbon uh, you know, energy. And uh, this is very threatening because the Algerian economy is highly dependent on oil and gas, as you all know. And my, the issue is that the current regime is just not able to introduce the large scale structural reforms we need. The current regime is a typical rentier regime, as we know in you know, standard political science definitions. It's a regime that relies on rent, and these rents allow it to have some sort of autonomy from society, right? There is autonomy because there is no real taxation. And as we all know, taxation creates these mechanisms of accountability. You know, because you pay taxes, you expect your, your leaders and, and you know, the people in power to represent you and uh, also uh, give you uh, political and economic rights. Uh, this, the, the problem is that what we saw is that the current regime is completely unable of promoting a, a dynamic, constructive and competitive economy. Uh, we're still seeing until lately um, entrepreneurs being sent to jail for no real motives. So the, the latest that we have like a leader 
in the pharma industry, who has no allegations of corruptions, who's a large employer, who's currently in jail. Because th there is this dynamic between, you know, uh, conflictual state business relations. And anytime you see like a private leader rising, the regime sees that as, as a, a systematic threat to its monopoly over power. So unfortunately, we're not seeing any meaningful reforms coming from the government that would change the nature of the Algerian economy away from its dependence on oil and gas. Um, the second point, just talking about the discourse and how nihilist is this speech and how negative it is or not, um, I mean, I really try to stick to facts. Uh, and I don't think that is the role of a researcher to suggest alternatives. I'm not a politician. I don't have a political party and I don't have any political ambitions. So I don't think it's my role. I'm, I'm an analyst, I'm a researcher, and I rely on data and empirics and like theories in political science. And I, I try to like, you know, follow that, but I don't think it's my role to suggest an alternative. I would be happy to see an alternative emerging as an Algerian citizen, of course, but I don't think it's my role. And, and like, I think it's just my, my political culture and my, my academic inclination is to point the problem to the people who hold power. Like, I, I completely agree with what Dr. Chumi was saying. Like, there is a problem within the Algerian political class. There is a deep problem within the elite. There has been a lack of, you know, coherent roadmaps that were put forward after the Herak, and we really lack that. There is a lack of negotiation also. I completely agree. However, my tradition and my political culture, in a way, forces me to point the, the problem is you know where the the power lies. I will judge al al masoul. Who al andu like al masouli yale? Who like it's the people who hold power that should be accountable. So for me, it's the regime. The regime holds the biggest responsibility. Or is the Algerian political class great? No. Are are like uh, do we have like no problems within the Herak or so on? No. There are a lot of internal conflicts and divisions that need to be resolved. But I think that like the core of the problem is very much the regime. And within that, the military institution being at its heart. It's an institution that has a very patronizing view over what Algerians uh, can do and their political right. And here I'm coming to Dr. Sami's question. Um, yeah, the military in Algeria has been you know, controlling power really uh, since, since, since independence is the most politically powerful institution in the country. There have been periods where it had less power relatively during Bouteflika's time, but this just resulted in a highly corrupt uh, civilian uh, regime. It did not result in any meaningful democratic construction. Um, and, and the problem is that the army very much sees its role as the, the father of the nation, as the only institution that holds the political and historical legitimacy to rule over Algerians. You know, it's the narrative that we fought for the independence of Algeria, we should rule over it. It, it, it's like not said very explicitly, but it's very much like what we see from the way the army, you know, decides on who's going to be president, on who's going to enter parliament, who's not going to enter parliament, and so on. And this is deeply problematic because, as we speak, you know, Algerians have been officially independent since 1962, and yet we don't see any, um, you know, uh, like Algerians don't have the freedom to to decide who is going to be the, their leaders, the, the people uh, ruling the country and so on. Um, to come back to the question on trends and kind of try and wrap up around that. Um, well, uh, we have the declarations from Macron. There was like a very clear statement in November by President Macron saying that he was in full support of President Tebboune. So Tabun at the time was uh, treating his COVID-19 infection in a German hospital, and there was publicly available data, I can find the speech now and just send it, uh, where Macron says that Tabun is very brave and that he fully supports him in power and the reforms he has engaged. 
uh, we know that there has been a lot of exchanges uh, between like Paris and, and Algiers. There was also the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, who was in Algeria before the um, legis no, before the constitutional refer referendum and asked Algerians to go vote, which is like arguably an interference in internal affairs, right? Like that there was the minister of a foreign nation calling Algerians to vote for the new constitution. I don't think this is, um, you know, um, the vote of power or, or interests. Um, I mean, purely uh, Algiers has always had uh, close ties to, to Paris. And I think that as long as we don't see any meaningful democratic change, a real rupture and a, a real uh, change in, in the system, not just in the regime, uh, I, I don't think we will see any, you know, um, clear, you know, rupture with, with Paris and so on. Uh, the final question, Dr. Sami, on like the future of Algerians, where and the future for Algeria, I think, the situation is very grim now, whether that is uh, politically or economically. Algerians are suffering from unemployment, uh, from now COVID-19 is, is adding to the crisis. And, and I don't think that the current regime with its current structure will be able to produce any hope for, for the millions of Algerians uh, Algeria's youth. And so I don't think that without a clear political transition, I don't think we will be able to achieve any economic, social, or, or political change. I will stop here. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Tinhinan, for, for your answers and for, for this amazing presentation. And uh, thank you to be with us in this program. I think you should uh, leave the uh, the debate now, yeah, right? Yeah, I have another meeting, so I'm just uh, thanks uh, for the invitation. Okay. Thanks to the other two speakers. Thank you. Inshallah, uh, we'll get you in another uh, program in person, inshallah, here in Istanbul. Inshallah. Before, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Let's come back to our <laughs> debate. Dr. Sami, do you have something to say? I have a question actually from one of the audience. And I'll try to translate it to Dr. Idris. The question says the speaker, meaning Dr. Idris, mentioned that the West does not want states in the Middle East to have autonomous popular sovereignty, but a form of popular sovereignty that is imperfect and dependent. However, why does the speaker believe that democracy will provide Algeria real popular sovereignty when even under a democratic regime, international relations, regime, uh, international relations requires that all states participating in the world state system, democratic or otherwise, is subject to foreign intervention, capital inflows, outflows, migration treaties, international economic standards, and so on, which necessitate, necessitate a form of compromised sovereignty in any case. From a realist perspective, without power, how will democracy help to protect Algeria from foreign intervention? Yani, يقول انك ذكرت ان الغرب لا يريد لدول الشرق الاوسط ان تكون دول ذات السياده لماذا تظن ان الديمقراطيه ستعيد السياده ولا تخضعها للتدخل الخارجي خصوصا في عدم وجود قوه حقيقيه للبلد وهذا الغرب ممكن يتدخل تدخل مباشر او غير مباشر من خلال اساليب كثيره بما فيها الاستثمارات المؤسسات الدوليه المعاهدات الهجره التسليح الى اخره لماذا تظن ان الجزائر اليوم عندها سياده حقيقيه يمكن لها أن تمارسها في حين أن الديمقراطية أيضا في في وجود الديمقراطية يمكن أن يكون هذه السيادة أيضا سيادة منقوصة ماذا تقول في ذلك؟ لا نسمعك أنت إذا ممكن أنميوت أنميوت الصوت الصوت يعني اضغط على الصوت نعم تمام لا ما زلنا لا نسمع ما زال هناك مشكلة في الصوت دكتور دريس We still can't hear هل تسمعوني؟ نعم آه جيد الآن جيد تفضل دكتور نعم أبدأ من حيث انتهى دكتور سامي فالعلاقة ما بين القوة والديمقراطية أن الديمقراطية في حد ذاتها عندما تجسد إرادة الشعوب وتحترم الرأي والرأي الآخر وتعزز الحريات تتحول الى قوه سياسيه. 
في الجزائر او غيرها من الدول ذات التجارب الديمقراطيه الفاديه ينبغي ان تتحول اول شيء الى قوه سياسيه لان قوه الشعوب دائما هي التي تصنع بقيه قوى سواء قوى اقتصاديه او قوى مجتمعيه او غيرها من الجوانب وهذا الشيء الذي حدث في الغرب عندما تحقق الاندماج الوطني وتجسد الاندماج او الانسجام بين المجتمع تحول الى قوه حقيقيه فالقوه هي التي تسمح لاصحاب الخبرات والمعارف وتسمح ايضا للاقتصاد بان يتطور وتسمح للمجتمع بان يرتقي وهذا الشيء الذي تريده الجزائر لان الغرب يعلم جيدا ان نجاح اي تجربه ديمقراطيه في الشرق الاوسط او في العالم العربي هو فشل لهم وهم يراهنون دائما على ضروره خلق اللا توازن في العالم العربي لان اللا توازن هو يخلق لا استقرار ولا استقرار دائما يقضي على البرامج التنمويه وبالتالي العلاقه هي واضحه وبسيطه ان الديمقراطيه تخلق الاستقرار والاستقرار بامكانه ان يخلق التنميه فالديمقراطيه نعم لوحدها تبقى غير كافيه لان الديمقراطيه هي اسلوب من اساليب الحكم لكن الديمقراطيه هي في حاجه الى الحكم الرشيد او الحكامه حكامه الدوله التي هي نمط جديد من انماط التسيير يعتمد على الشفافيه والنزاهه والاداء والفاعليه لذلك هنا يمكن الحديث على السياده السياده ايضا ليست بمفهوم جون بودان الذي ركز على تصور مغلق السياده واليوم نحن في اطار العولمه والتحديات التي تواجهها الدوله الوطنيه في العالم العربي وفي عالم الجنوب ككل اصبحت السياده على المحك حسب ما يعني صرح به الكثير من علماء الغرب سواء نتحدث على نعوم تشومسكي نتحدث على صامويل هانتينغتون نتحدث على فرانسيس كوكياما كلهم اكدوا على ان مفهوم السياده اصبح مفهوم متعدد فاليوم لم نعد نتحدث على السياده القطريه او السياده الترابيه او السياده العسكريه او السياده السياسيه او السياده الاقتصاديه او السياده الثقافيه والاعلاميه بل اصبحنا حتى نتحدث على السياده السيبرانيه والسياده الافتراضيه وهي مجالات مهمه مع انه دائما بالنسبه للجزائر هناك ثلاث مفردات تشتغل عليهم السياسه الخارجيه الجزائريه هي السياده والتنميه والامن وهنا دائما اعود لما علقت عليه الدكتوره قاضي عندما تتحدث على امكانيه تطور نظام سياسي وانفتاح نظام سياسي بحد ذاته، نعم الجزائر او نظام سياسي الجزائري هو مجبر دائما على ان يقدم تنازلات، حتى الجزائر ما بعد الحراك هي في حاجه دائما الى الالتفات لمطالب الحراك ومطالب الكثير من 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 من, من انشغالات المجتمع الجزائري والشارع الجزائري، وهنا لا ننكر ايضا ان هناك الكثير من التحديات، حتى الحراك في حد ذاته لم يبقى ذاك الحراك السليم الذي أوقف العهدة الخامسة وطرد الكثير من رموز النظام الأسبق بل تحول وأصبح حراك مخترق وظهرت فيه رايات غير الراية الوطنية ظهرت فيه شعارات لا ترتبط بالمجتمع الجزائري ظهور الفيمينيست وغيرهم من من الممارسات وهناك أيضا حتى محاولة اختراق من قبل جماعات إرهابية وجماعات متطرفة من أجل خلق لا أمن داخل الجزائر وبالتالي الغرب دائما في في فلسفته هو يسعى دائما إلى إجهاض أي تجربة ديمقراطية ناجحة واعطيك مثال بما يحدث في تونس هذه الايام، هذه التجاذبات التجاذبات الدوليه بين من يطالب بضروره استمرار المسار الديمقراطي والحفاظ على الارضيه الدستوريه في تونس، وبين اطراف اخرى هي تشجع الانقلاب وتشجع دائما رفض اللوائح القانونيه والاطار الدستوري الناظم للعمل السياسي في تونس، وللاسف ان هناك بعض الدول العربيه اصبحت موظفه وكما اشرت هناك دول ايضا تعيش فوبيا الديمقراطيه وتتخوف من نجاح الديمقراطيه والدول هذه معروفه ومعلومه وبالتالي في الجزائر اعتقد انه ينبغي تحول يعني وهذا تحدثت عليه الاستاذه القاضي الجزائر الجديده ينبغي ان تتحول من شعار الى مشروع مجتمع وبالتالي تتجسد رؤيه سياسيه ورؤيه استراتيجيه للجزائر لها العديد من الجوانب سواء جانب اقتصادي او جانب اجتماعي او جانب اجتماعي او جانب ثقافي ليتمسك المجتمع بهذه الرؤيه وفي الاخير انه اي نظام سياسي سواء نتحدث على مساله سقوط النظام السياسي الجزائري او تكيف النظام السياسي الجزائري نحن في ادبيه علم السياسه لدينا ثلاث خصائص النظام السياسي الخصيصه الاولى هي الاستمراريه النظام السياسي ينبغي ان يستمر ويتطور النقطة الثانية هو التكيف أن يتكيف النظام السياسي مع المجريات ومع الأحداث ومع التحولات الإقليمية والدولية 
والنقطه الثالثه هي الصيانه الذاتيه وبالتالي النظام السياسي في الجزائر هو في حاجه الى الصيانه الذاتيه وبالتالي ينبغي دائما محاوله مغالبه بعض السلوكات الماضيه كديمقراطيه الواجهه وغيرها من الممارسات حتى الاحزاب السياسيه الحاليه نعم المجتمع الجزائري له ذاكره سلبيه مرتبطه بالاحزاب السياسيه بمختلف تياراتها سواء كان تيار وطني ممثل في حزب الافلان او الارندي او غيره من الاحزاب او الاحزاب الاسلاميه سواء الحرق المجتمع السلمو وغيرها من الاحزاب او حتى بعض الاحزاب اليساريه التي امتنعت عن المشاركه اصلا في الانتخابات التشريعيه الماضيه وللاسف هذه الاحزاب اليساريه سواء نتحدث عن الار سي دي او نتحدث عن حزب العمال او الاف هي اصلا احزاب لا تمتلك قواعد انتخابيه او اوعيه نضاليه داخل الوطن وتواجد وحتى سر فوز هذه الانتخابات الكلاسيكيه او انتخابات او احزاب موالاه بالنسبه للرئيس الاسبق عبد العزيز بوتفليقه هي تمتلك ان هذه الاحزاب تمتلك قواعد نضاليه تمتلك هياكل كحزب جبهه التحرير فهو متواجد في 1540 بلديه متواجد في 58 ولايه نفس الشيء بالنسبه للارادي وبالتالي وهم استفادوا ايضا في اطار اخر من ضعف المشاركه السياسيه التي كانت 23% ومع ذلك انا في الجزائر فكرتي التي ادافع عليها هو انه نستطيع هذه التجربه على علتها وهذه الانتخابات على ضعف المشاركه فيها نستطيع ان نبني عليها وان نستثمر من اجل خلق ثقافه انتخابيه في المستقبل ومن اجل تجسيد حقيقي لمفهوم المواطنه ويبقى دائما ان ننظر نظره ايجابيه مع انه انا دعوت اكثر من مره حتى الاحزاب الاسلاميه هي في حاجه الى تجديد خطابها السياسي بما يتماشى والمعطيات العصريه بطبيعه الحال نحن امام جيل وخاصه الجزائر ما بعد الحراك ليست هي الجزائر ما قبل الحراك ونفس الشيء بالنسبه لبقيه الاحزاب مع ضروره ان يتمسك المجتمع بمشروع مكافحه الفساد وينبغي ان ربما نتجسد او نتمسك بمشترك وطني واحد يتمثل في العداله يتمثل في الشفافيه والنزاهه يتمثل في في مكانه الجزائر الدوليه وفي قدرتها الدبلوماسيه في اداره الكثير من القضايا هذه الاشياء هي المهمه ينبغي ان نتمسك بها وبالتالي اعود في الاخير لانه الغرب يرفض نجاح الديمقراطيه في هذه الدول ويبحث دائما على الفاسدين والمفسدين واكبر فاسدين في الجزائر هم مرتبطين بمستعمرنا السابق في فرنسا وحتى الاحزاب المرتبطه بفرنسا هي احزاب فاسده وغيرها من الشخصيات وبالتالي انه خلاص من المستعمر السابق يعني العوده او عوده مقدرات الجزائر وانتم تعلمون ان الثروات الطبيعيه في الجزائر هي كثيره بترول وغاز ومعادن وغيرها حتى الشمس اصبحت طاقه حتى الانسان الجزائري ارى انه في حد ذاته وهو طاقه هو وقود حيوي هو ماده خام للجزائر وبالتالي انه الجزائر كما كانت الفكره التي اطرحها مكه للثوار وقبل الاحرار بامكانه اليوم ان تعود بقوه لتكون ربما مناره ديمقراطيه ونجد الى جانب المفردات والمفاهيم المستخدمه في السياسه الخارجيه الجزائريه عندما نتحدث على مكافحه الارهاب نتحدث على محاربه جريمه ومنظمه بامكان ايضا ان نتحدث على حكامه الدوله ونتحدث على التوجه نحو الديمقراطيه ونتحدث على غيرها من المفاهيم الايجابيه كالتنميه وتحسين المستوى وتعزيز مشاركه الشعوب في اتخاذ القرار. شكرا لكم جميعا كل باسمي ومقامي تحياتي الخاصه لكل فرد منكم وانا استفدت كثيرا من مداخلاتكم. Uh, let me translate very quickly, and then uh, the last series of questions will be for Dr. Abdel-Nur. He said, of course, there is a difference between power and democracy. Uh, democracy is the embodiment of the uh, popular will, of the people's will, and it's supposed to increase freedom in society and transform it into a political power. When that happens, when, when democracy becomes a political power, then people will start uh, um, uh, expressing themselves and it, it, it transforms it into social as well as economic uh, power. And of course, this is the meaning of democracy that we see you know, in, the civil, in civil society when uh, that political power, because of democracy, it starts affecting and impacting society and makes it develop and progress as in any other uh, successful democratic uh, experiment. Uh, but of course, what, uh, what the West is trying to do is to create imbalance is to uh, prevent democracy from taking hold in society so that these societies will never be stable and they will never be able to progress and transform this political power into other kinds of power, including economic. Democracy is just a, uh, a, 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 a method of, of governing uh, that is supposed to embody and to have and to include transparency, uh, fairness, uh, uh, good uh, governance, uh, uh, effectiveness, uh, sovereignty. 
But sovereignty is not a closed uh, uh, concept. Uh, with the emergence of globalization, all these uh, challenges that are taking place today have put the concept of the nation state system under scrutiny uh, uh, as Chomsky, Huntington and Fukuyama also uh, uh, argued in different, in different books and articles that the, the meaning of sovereignty, whether it's economic, uh, cultural, political, social, uh, all kinds of sovereignty, even uh, uh, cyber sovereignty today is under attack. In Algeria, there are three main uh, 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 concepts that need to be taken into consideration that the, the, the Algerian political system uh, it tries to put in front and center. One is sovereignty, two is development, and three is security. And as Dr. Qadi says that we need in Algeria uh, political openness. And the, the regime has uh, compromised, has, has uh, offered compromises to the demands of the Hirak, of the popular movements. Uh, uh, as as uh, 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 as seen in the in the Algerian street, there are also there have been uh, challenges to this popular movement uh, that they have been penetrated, you know, including communists and even even some terrorist groups uh, who have uh, introduced uh, a situation where instability and insecurity has uh, have been affected in in Algeria. But to sum up, the West wants to. Uh, uh, abort uh, all democratic experiments. The best example that we see today is in Tunisia, that there are forces within the, the uh, Western, uh, uh, within the West, as well as uh, regional powers. Uh, we, we know for a fact that there are Arab states that have been uh, uh, taking it upon themselves to abort all democratic experiments in the region. We don't have to name them by names, they are known. They are, have been working uh, as counter-revolutionary forces against the democracy, against the, the popular will. And uh, what uh, Algeria wants and uh, uh, what I want is to transform this slogan of democratization into an actual project in society that has a strategic vision uh, that encompasses political, economic, social, uh, and cultural. In, uh, in Algeria, we have three main characteristics uh, which is continuity, adaptation, and self-renewal. These are the three uh, uh, characteristics that we would like to uh, 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 emphasize. And, and finally, uh, I just want to note that uh, Algerian, the Algerian people have a negative uh, attitude towards uh, parties in, 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 gen in general, but maybe that's also because of the, the, the experience in the past few decades. And that goes around, you know, whether it is the the traditional uh, parties or Islamic parties or even liberal and socialist parties. But let's not forget that uh, some of these parties do have history is, uh, you know, uh, uh, of struggle, of, of resistance. They have their own base and uh, they have won because of the low turnout. So it was their own base that have turned out and elected uh, them. In my opinion, we can uh, build on this experiment even with all the faults uh, and the and the uh, the drawbacks that it has, we can build on it. We can continue. It's a, a positive step. Uh, we need to renew the uh, the uh, political discourse for the parties, uh, including the Islamic parties. Uh, Algeria today, after the Hirak, is not the same as Algeria before uh, the Hirak. We need to struggle and we need to uh, uh, resist against corruption and fight corruption. We need to. Uh, talk about justice, transparency, fairness in society, and also to uh, make the uh, position of Algeria internationally a better one. Uh, in, 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 in conclusion, the West does not want us to have democracy. They want corrupt people to rule us. Okay, Dr. Sami, thank you for your translation. Mashallah. Uh, and I would like to make two or three questions to uh, our doctor, uh, Tumi, Dr. Tumi. Then I will come back to Dr. Atiya with final question or two questions. We have a lot of questions and, <laughs> and little time. So Dr. Tumi, I would like to benefit from your experience in France. In France, and you spend uh, years there and uh, you have uh, 
well known how how France how France behave and the relationships uh, with Algeria. So uh, I bring the same question uh, about the the indications of the influence France influence in Algeria. Now you know that in military term Russia is dominated in Algeria in economic uh, term. This Chinese is the number one. Even the Americans are uh, 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 the arts disappears there in Algeria. So and now the Turkish uh, the Turkish influence with infrastructures and many projects uh, and even in cultural term. So and many people now uh, around the Arabic world or uh, or in or outside uh, they they. Uh, repeat the same narrative. France dominates Algerian decisions and uh, and put uh, obstacles uh, in the way of democratic change in Algeria. Do you think really France has such huge influence now uh, in Algeria, now on Algerian regime? Of course, this is the first question. The second one is another level. And you mentioned very crucial uh, terms uh, the political, uh, the cultural, uh, the political culture in Algeria, and the elite, the role of elites in Algeria. Uh, do you think now the people, Algerian people, have such like uh, enough democratic, uh, cultural, uh, uh, political, cultural to to understand the game uh, and to play well with this with such regime? Strong regime. Do you think that, that Algerians has such you know democratic culture? And the third one is regarding the political the, the, the political elites. And you mentioned in your presentation the lack of such uh, political uh, leaders. And you mentioned names like uh, Mehri and uh, and others. Uh, and now we have the, 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 the we, we have the empty arena political arena in Algeria. But do you think now, now I, I see, I see uh, only one huge political party, organized party. This is my, <laughs> I don't know if you are, agree or not, but I need your comment. Harakat Hems now, the, the biggest Islamic movement in Algeria now, uh, have such organized mind, organized uh, party, such strong leader and uh, with leader, uh, have a uh, huge experience since the 90s or before. So do you think such party, why such, such kind of parties cannot reach power until now? And do you think that the regime, the political regime still fear from Islamists uh, uh, influenced by the 90s, of course? Dr. Jalal, all the questions are very, very interesting, but I will take uh, your questions from the third one about the role of the Islamists and how uh, powerful they are in the Algerian political spectrum and their also implementation within the society. Uh, I agree with you, yes. I mean, on theory, yes, they are uh, strong. They have the, uh, let's say, a solid, as I stated earlier, a solid electoral or reservoir vote. However, the, you mentioned Hams. Uh, Hams get chopped, I would say, uh, uh, indirectly into the strategy of the regime. And when he is speaking about the post FIS, uh, by when the generals made the coup against President Shirley Benjdidi in 92 and aborted the democratic process that started at that time. So the uh, MSP, for instance, they get again trapped by themselves by following the strategy of th that was set by the regime back then. However, this mis tactical mistake and then, unfortunately, it turned out to be strategic mistake because it's been going on for almost a quarter, 25 years now. They lost their credibility. 
they lost actually the discourse and they lost in the course of the trajectory of the political process that was set at that time by President Bouteflika. So however, as you stated or you said, like the, it is or the only party that you can see is well organized with a solid grassroots and a political uh, program and so on. But the problem is about the leader. And if you don't have a leader, you cannot deliver. And we saw that. I mean, you will ask, I mean, one can argue about the X fees, how the FIS delivered in 1991 during the municipal local elections and then in the parliamentary elections, because they have at that time, the party had a leader. Now, whether this leader had a solid strategy in the long run, that's another story. But at that moment, he had the leader and the message and the base. The masses all go to all at that time go together. These days, unfortunately, they are divided. I mean, and we saw that within the Hams party, we saw this day or the last say five years, there are some like defections from the party. We see the Bengri now, we saw the experience of uh, rule and so on. So it's too early today to say that the Islamists are coming or are like restructuring themselves. However, I can argue also in the FLN party, it's still strong and it's getting stronger. And I think we will see this in the next local elections, the municipal elections. And I think that will be the decisive moment for the political parties, including the so-called non-party or the independents that are the backbone of the president. For your second question about the role of the elite, is it about the role of the elite in the- About political culture. Uh, uh, have Algerian people and of democratic political culture to yeah. play the game of- Sure, I mean, but the political culture, it, is, it does exist in Algeria and Algerian in, 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 and as an individual is fully politicized. And I mean, he breathes, she breathes politics, but the problem is not structured, is not again, as I stated, is not guided. It doesn't mean he has to be patronized as Dr. Khadi mentioned by let's say a uh, iconic leader or an institution like the, instit the military institution. The problem here with this political culture, and as you said, I know where you are going by your question, you said um, he has this kind of an undemocratic culture. No, I would argue the opposite. He is willing, he wants to debate, he wants to share his and her ideas. He wants to implement his, her ideas through a democratic means via elections, for instance. But the problem, are the tools are not adaptable. The mechanism of the democratic process is there, but the tools are not there. Why? Because I think it meant purposely to not have these solid tools to uh, implement this project or this message for a new generation that can lead this new generation who we don't know. I mean, they, like, they came out of the black box. The problem in Algeria, like in Egypt or in other uh, authoritarian uh, regimes, the, even the elite or the political establishment want or they want to come from their, uh, their schools of thought. So this is an interesting question here. You see this generation who came out the, the first democratic process of the 90s, who are now in their 50s, in their 40s, late, I mean, even someone who was born in 90, he is 30 today, but and who, who belong or who joined the this mentality. And fortunately, they still think like the school of the 60s and the 70s. And we saw that in their crisis management and also to some extent, those people are today ruling the country. 
either in high level or as subalterns. So this is the problem. The problem, it's not about the idea of whether they are undemocratic or they don't want to have, let's say, a idea of expecting the other's thoughts or uh, political uh, orientation. The problem is they think they hold the truth. And this is the problem of the elite. And when we speak about the elite, it goes in both ways, the Arabophone one and the Francophone one. And the, the worst here, the, these two elites are hijacking the entire democratic process by letting the people or the masses to divorce themselves from, the, from politics. And this is the message that has been sent at every or at, at each elections. But as I told you, I may say, okay, why my vote doesn't count? Why should I vote or why should I bother? This is the answer. As far as your first question about the role of France in Algeria's politics, indeed, in Algeria, it's the usual suspect. It's, of course, France. And this is about history, about our tragic history and the geographic proximity with France. But as you know, Algeria, French Algerian relations, are, they are not normal. They've never been normal. And the one who defined them, it's not me, it's President Boumedien. And later on, Bouteflika, who said there is no such a normative relations with France. There is something exceptional between the two countries. Let's put it in this way. It's like they are in this hate and love story. But this is because of history, the tragic history and the geographic proximity. Now, the role, let's say, of France is huge, as you said. I think we are a little bit over exaggerating on this. However, it is, there is a, again, a huge French, uh, France's uh, lobbies inside uh, the country and to some extent, even in the high uh, sensitive position levels. In, for instance, in administration, in education system, we saw that and you, you know, we saw this sterile debate between the Arabization program and the Francization, whatever we can call it. But you, bring, you brought an interesting point about the role of Turkey here. And I think Turkey as a raising state and Turkey, the, let's say, post uh, Arab Spring and the, in, in our region during the Libyan crisis had took that opportunity of vacuum power and filled this role and positioned itself as a serious and credible partner with the region entirely, not only with Algeria, but with Tunisia, with Morocco, eventually today with uh, Libya, mm -hmm. even though with Egypt, despite the uh, tensions or sometimes that reach the level of escalation between the two countries, but they, both countries know their limits. So Turkey today is uh, positioning itself to fill that gap that first of all has left, or the gap was left by uh, the pivotal state in the region like Algeria and uh, Egypt, if, I'm, if we speak about the Libyan crisis. And also the uh, mistake, that maybe like to, give me like two minutes. And, yeah, because we, we don't have enough time. So I just quickly conclude, please. I see. So and then, so but the mistake that President Macron had made in his Libya policy. So Turkey today has a good image, not only in Algeria but also in the entire region. And it's very interesting. I will sum up with this. Uh, Dr. Atiyah spoke or mentioned the Algeria will be seen as a model in the future. Sure, why not? But I think we Algerians today, if we are looking for a model, we should look at Turkish model. In, in its experience with the democratic process. It seems like it's working in Turkey, and I think with many reasons, societal, sociological, and even traditional cultural elements, 
I go towards that uh, direction to look at uh, seriously at the Turkish model. And thank uh, you. In, it's enough clear. But, uh, thank you, Dr. Tumi. I think uh, we need another uh, panel to discuss such geopolitical issues in North okay. Africa. Uh, so uh, before I give the, the floor to Dr. Sami, I have in one minute, like a question, the final question to Dr. Atiyah, then the, you conclude Dr. Sami. Uh, Dr. Atiyah, so uh, just a quick question in, and I need quick answers too, please. So many analysts uh, argue that President Tabun is the weakest president in Algerian history since the independence, the weakest one, and uh, was used by some generals, by uh, by El Gaid, uh, by El Gaid Arbiyahmo, and uh, now by another generals, uh, just to make change enough change to this system. Uh, to make it strong again after uh, after uh, was weakened by Bouteflika's era. Uh, and you know, Bouteflika gathered all the power and uh, marginalized the, uh, the army from politics. What do you think about that? I think that the Rahil the من خلال دائما تعهده بعدم إراقة قطر الدم والحراك الجزائري قلت أنه مبهر وأجدده دائما هو حراك مبهر لأنه حراك تجاوز 20 مليون نسمة في بدايته وفي أغلب مدنه ولم نشهد ولا إراقة قطر الدم واحدة ولا عنف ولا تعنيف ولا كسر الأجار ولا تلبيت للبيئة بل كان حراك يؤكد على تحول كبير في سلوك المجتمع الجزائري وفي نضج مهم جدا والدليل على ذلك أنه ما شهدناه خلال فترة ما بعد الحراك أن المجتمع المدني أصبح يلعب أدوار مهمة وما حدث في ظل هذه الجائحة الصحية من تضامن كبير بالنسبة للمجتمع المدني هو يؤكد على أيضا نوع آخر من نوع التضامن هذا التضامن المجتمعي الحكومي بحيث وجد المجتمع المدني إلى جانب السلطات العمومية يلعب في دور مهم جدا ويقدم مساعدات وحتى ونحن هذه الأيام نعيش أزمة صحية خانقة ونحن تحت إجراءات مشددة في إطار الحجر الصحي نجد المجتمع المدني يقدم مساعدات المستشفيات يبحث عن مكثفات الأكسجين وغيرهم وبالتالي العلاقة المدنية العسكرية علاقة مهمة سواء من خلال الدور القيد صالح رحمه الله في إدارة هذه المرحلة الانتقالية وتعهده على ضرورة خروج الجزائر بخرج سليم وفق قواعد الدستور دكتور إدريس الآن للأطر القانونية دكتور إدريس الآن هل يتم هل هل يتم خلال رئيس بول الآن من طرف جنرالات آخرين من أجل إعادة إعادة تنظيم الجيش لنفسه أن يكون هو مركز دائما مركز سياسة في الجزائر بعد عقود من تهميشه من طرف بوتفليقة والله سيد عبد الجتبون في في حواره مع قناة الجزيرة وفي حواره مع كثير من وسائل الإعلام قال أنه قائد الأعلى للقوات المسلحة وأنه وزير دفاع وبالتالي المؤسسة العسكرية الجزائرية هي تتجه إلى الاحترافية والعصرنة ونسعى لتطوير الجيش خاصة في المجالات الجديدة للدفاع سواء المجال السبراني أو نتحدث حتى على استكمال وتعزيز القوة العسكرية في المجال البحري وفي المجال الفضائي وفي المجال الجوي وبالتالي هي مجالات خمسة مهمة بالنسبة لنا في الجزائر مجال البري البحري الجوي الفضائي والمجال السبراني والمؤسسة العسكرية هي مؤسسة دستورية مثل مثل بقية المؤسسات كالبرلمان أو مؤسسة الرئاسة أو السلطات التنفيذية أو الوزارات أو غيرها المؤسسات وبالتالي أنه ذاك التضخيم القديم بأن الجيش هو مركز السلطة ومركز صناعة القرار أعتقد أنه الجيش يتجه إلى وظيفته الأساسية هي الدفاع عن الوطن والذود عن الوطن واليوم في إطار هذه العلاقات المدنية العسكرية الجديدة نجد الجيش يساعد المجتمع سواء إجراء أزمة الصحة الخاصة بكورونا سواء في الكوارث الكبرى والأحداث 
المتعلقه بالفيضان وغيرها نجد دائما المؤسسه العسكريه تقدم مساعدات وفي مجالات اخرى وبالتالي انا بودي ان اؤكد على انه ينبغي الاستثمار في هذه العلاقه المدنيه العسكريه مع انه الابواق الخارجيه التي تقول انه الجيش هو مركز سلطه في الجزائر اعتقد هذا هذا امر غير منطقي كثير من الدول يعتقدوا انه الجيش متواجد في كل مكان في الجزائر وانا بل بالعكس اليوم حتى المؤسسه العسكريه لها علاقات مع 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 النخب العلميه ومع ومع الفاعلين السياسيين وهي علاقات ايجابيه الجنرالات الجزائر الاغلب العام انهم حاملين شهادات جامعيه وحاملين شهادات دكتوراه ويؤمنون بان العلم هو القاطره التي تقود المجتمع الجزائري وبالتالي احترافيه الجيش عصرانته انفتاح للمؤسسه العسكريه سواء على مؤسسات نظاميه اخرى مثل الشرطه او الجمارك او الحمايه المدنيه وبالتالي خلق شراكه حقيقيه وانفتاح ايضا الجيش على مؤسسات ذات طابع علمي مثل الجامعات ومراكز البحث وغيرها من اجل تعزيز هذه العلاقه وعصرنه كل المؤسسات الوطنيه لانه في اعتقادي انه الجزائر لا تستطيع ان تكون قوة عسكرية فقط بل هي قوة عسكرية وقوة سياسية وقوة مجتمعية والعملية تكون مركبة وتوجه الجزائر نحو توجهات منطقية ومأمولة كما أنه حتى الدستور الجزائري 2020 ربما أحدث فقرة متعلقة بإمكانية مشاركة وحدات من الجيش في حفظ السلام في, 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 في الإطار الإفريقي أو في العربي تحت شرعية هيئة الأمم المتحدة وهذا دائما بالعودة لاستشارة البرلمان كونه يمثل الإرادة الشعبية هي نقطة مهمة وبالتالي ربما اعطاء دور خارجي للجيش الجزائري ومع ذلك انه العلاقه المدنيه العسكريه هي علاقه مهمه جدا كما اشرت انه الجيش الحامي للمسار الدستوري سنه 2019 كان له دور بارز ولولا المؤسسه العسكريه لكانت الجزائر في مهاب الريح وربما دعاه المراحل الانتقاليه ودعاه المجلس الانتقالي لذهبوا الى راب التجربه الديمقراطيه ولا حدث بمثل ما حدث في التسعينيات لانه ربط العمليه ببعضها البعض ربما اعود لها وتحدث عن العشرين السوداء لانه للاسف الجزائر تم غسل ثياب الرثه في الجزائر وكان من دفع ثمن هم الجزائريين لوحدهم وهذا في سبيل تجربه ديمقراطيه ونقطه اخيره اسمحوا لي انه حتى لا يمكن ربط ما حدث في الجزائر او احداث الجزائر 2019 باحداث الربيع العربي او مسمي بالربيع العربي فالتجربتين مختلفتين بل انه الجزائر كانت سباقه سنه 1989 واليوم من خلال 1919 الجزائر تخلق نموذج جديد سواء في الحراك او في يعني هذا الحراك انا في اعتقادي انه نسميه حراك وانما هو في الاساس تواضع نسميه في الاساس هي ثوره ديمقراطيه بمثل ما يشير لها دائما لاري دايمون تؤكد على ان المجتمع الجزائري يتمسك بالديمقراطيه ويريد نجاح سياسي حقيقي والمؤسسه العسكريه تبقى كمؤسسه دستوريه ترافق هذا العمل السياسي وترافق هذه التوجهات لكن لا تتدخل في العمل السياسي ولا تصنع القرار السياسي اطلاقا شكرا شكرا جزيلا على هذه المداخله دكتور ادريس دكتور سامي if you have any comments before we conclude Well, I just translate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I forget. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, he said that, uh, let me see. Yes, he said that the previous, uh, after your question, the answer was is the previous chief of staff, Fayed Saleh, he created a new model of the uh, civil military relations in Algeria. The Iraq, the popular movement, was certainly a, a tremendous asset. Uh, which included over 20 million people taking uh, uh, participating in it. Uh, and, and yet there was not a single uh, drop of blood uh, during all that uh, peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful movement and demonstrations. It was, it was a new behavior of the Algerian society. And now we see that the civic society in Algeria is playing an impo important roles. Uh, particularly we see it today Uh, with Corona, with the pandemic, we see the social solidarity taking place, how people are helping each other, even though we have a health crisis in society, we see how they help the, the hospitals. Uh, so the, the civil military relations in Algeria is, is an important one, and that it, it is now being regulated through the constitution. And that uh, it is not fair to say that uh, the military is the center of power in Algeria. Uh, actually, it, it, is, it is probably being rebalanced because during Bouteflika, Bouteflika era, the, uh, many people saw that he was marginalizing the, the military institution. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the, milit the, the, the military in Algeria is a constitutional institution, the same as any other constitutions. There are uh, uh, 
uh, it is part of, of the authority and power. It is not the center of authority and power. And that they, uh, uh, they, they are trying to turn into becoming a professional army, uh, even though they are trying to, to help also civil society in different uh, uh, roles, such as also during the, the, uh, the, the corona crisis. Uh, so my, my view is that we need to uh, invest in the, in the military relation. It is not logical that uh, uh, Algeria uh, uh, is being told that it is, it is a military state, uh, that we see that it's, 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 uh, the, the military in Algeria is trying to build positive relations with, the, with elites in Algeria. They, they believe that uh, science and technology is what's going to lead to progress uh, in Algeria. They try to build on partnerships with, with uh, universities, with think tanks, with research centers. And that is, uh, Algeria cannot be a military power only. This is not logical. It has to also be uh, pow uh, powerful in other areas, uh, including uh, as the constitution stated, they can also serve as uh, peace, uh, peace troops in, in different uh, international arenas in, in Africa with the United Nations to have a, a, an outside role. Uh, without the military institution, uh, who knows what Algeria could have been today. Uh, Algerians have paid a great price for democracy, uh, even before the Arab Spring took place back in 1989, over a quarter of a million. Algeria is trying to create a new model uh, for change in, in, the, in, the, in the region, a democratic revolution, and that uh, society is going to uphold, to hold to it, and uh, the military institution will try to help in these tendencies. Okay, thank you so much. I mean, we've stated, you know, we've gone through our time by over 20 minutes. I wanna thank our speakers. I wanna thank Jalal for his, uh, for leading the, the, uh, the, the moderation of this session. It was uh, uh, many issues, many points of view were, were provided. And I think we tried to be balanced and of course, uh, it's the audience that they can make up their mind. We had two opposing views, whether what's happening in Algeria uh, the, uh, in the past few months represent a gradual transition toward democracy, whether, whether it is actually a recreation of the old regime uh, at the expense of real democracy. Time will only tell which course uh, is going to prevail. Uh, I certainly hope that this is not the last uh, session, the last seminar that we're going to hold in North Africa. I imagine that we're going to come back uh, to discuss Tunisia as well as Algeria's foreign policy and the many changes taking place in the region. Uh, we will have uh, a, a conference and part of that conference, you know, in, in the future is going to also uh, focus on North Africa. I invite you. Uh, in the next few months, we're going to have several seminars in these areas. Thank you very much, Jalal. Thank you, Dr. Abdelnour. Thank you, Dr. Idris. And thank you also for Dr. Al-Qadi for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this. And I hope to see you here next time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much.